So, Rita, you've been talking about art for hotels, and you talked about the Midwest and the sense of homeness or not. Now you're going to come into your new work, right? You've got what's the name of your new book? I think it's so exciting to come and write a novella. You said this was. Uh, I think of it as a novel, but I think lengthwise maybe it's better called novella. And what's it? How did it come about? So there's a little story attached to it. We are promised happiness if we follow certain steps. And uh, today in popular culture, a very widely spread practice is teaching people to be happy, teaching them strategies how to be happy. And that got me interested because I thought, you know, this is the land of plenty. People have almost everything they want, or at least that's the general impression that the world has about this country. How come that happiness, which is, you know, our constitutional right, does not happen. So um, one thing I looked at is this extreme busyness that is prized and valued and experienced uh, in this culture. And I know it from my own experience that the, my schedule in Bowling Green was such that I had hardly time for anything. I know from experience of my colleagues uh, that they literally had to sleep four hours a day, especially, say, entry-level teachers, because they had so much to do. So, uh, uh, for example, a, a colleague of mine who was in the PhD program with me, she told me that she knew things were going wrong in her life when she caught herself one morning showering and eating cereal at the same time so she would save a few minutes that she can use then to work and to achieve things. And, you know, that was really shocking to me that anybody would do that. But I understood it completely. In fact, I considered it. I thought, you know, that's an idea. You know, maybe I don't have to do this as two separate activities. But if I blend them, I, I will have five minutes longer for I don't know what. And I think, again, it was partly due to this impression they leave you with that you have to be doing something all the time, that somehow you're always lacking, you're always short. Uh, short. So that gave me an idea to look at a, sort of an average Midwestern average, not so much average, but not in any way uh, different from thousands of other women of her generation, a woman in her late 30s now, that means she would be sort of in that sort of post-feminist era when uh, allegedly women now have rights and now have equality, and so now she can... Really, there literally should be nothing in her way to achieve what she wants. So is that the <clears throat> angst that, that you're seeing feminine has, feminism has to offer in the sense there is no limit? Are you saying that because certain things are satisfied in the life that then the limits of trying to satisfy other intra-psychic issues become more prominent? Is that what you're talking about here? I, actually, I was kind of talking about uh, the fact that some of these women believe that there's really nothing to do in, in fight of women's rights <clears throat> anymore, which I don't happen to believe is true. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, we were talking about the edge of the mind, the mm -hmm. edge, the cutting edge. Is that why writers write? Because they might see a culture where all the material desires are satisfied and women's rights have been attained mm -hmm. so that now <clears throat> there's nothing to long for. So the intra-psychic or the inner longing starts to show its head because, because the material things are taken care of. So now we really look at what makes us happy. Well, I, I think that there's some to that. Uh, but these happiness training seminars, which is what I'm sort of starting my book with, mm -hmm. are for people who have their material needs, almost everything satisfied. They have actually achieved in life what they always thought they wanted, mm -hmm. and still they're not happy. Uh, that, that's one side of it. Another side of it is that, of course, especially since 2008 and the crash, uh, they um, people have been fired and laid off and never replaced. So right. uh, everybody's workload has gone up. In certain professions where you have 
a salary and you're not paid by the hour, mm -hmm. they will stretch your hours as much as they want. That was true for academics, that's mm -hmm. true for schools, that's true for many places. My novel is called uh, Conditions of Extreme Scarcity. That's so funny. Which is, yes, <laughs> counterintuitive when you know what this, this country thinks about its um, plentiful uh, av availability of everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I wanted to see what kind of scarcities rule our lives, because they clearly do. If you eat your cereal and shower at the same time, then there's something wrong. If you have to pull out a gun and kill somebody on 101 because they're cut in front of you because you need to get to work, there's something wrong there. I mean, there's obviously something wrong. So I wanted to look at this character who has achieved everything she thought she wanted and still is kind of miserable. So, it so is to this do. an anti-corporate novel? Not necessarily. I'm not working at all with... Uh, my setting is not a big corporation. Mm -hmm. It's a relatively small uh, advertising agency. I see. Uh, so uh, I think this permeates the workplace. Where you're always made to feel like you, you're not quite contributing enough and there isn't ever enough money for everything, so you need to pitch in and volunteer. And I think that is a management model. Excellent. So is that the <clears throat> management model novel, what you're really creating? It, it's not the management. Uh, it has nothing, I know, I was not, kidding. Yeah, I, I know, I know. It's, it's not that. Yeah. It, yeah. It's mostly about, it's like a woman's novel of dissatisfaction. So mm -hmm. I did everything I'm supposed to do, mm -hmm. and I not only didn't I get what I want, but I really didn't even know what I should want. I mm -hmm. was following uh, the prescription of the culture, and I never actually broke out of that mold to look at other possibilities. So did that. she find what it is she wanted to do she, alternatively? She does in, in actually the very opening chapter of, of the book, and uh, so the rest of the novel is devoted to her deciding if she's ever, or even going to follow up on that, because following up on that means uh, leaving her safe uh, path that she had always been on and doing something different. Not not so dramatically different, but different from what she had been brought up to believe is are good choices. You talked about sometimes the characters uh, occupying your consciousness and the voices of the characters or their physical presence becomes almost overwhelming. I, I can talk about it and then we can... Uh, yeah. And that's just a part of my process. Mm -hmm. uh, when I'm writing a novel like this about somebody else, not me, yes. so the basic fact of their lives and their families and all that are not familiar to me, or that they don't exist, I have to create them first. I can't just start and then, you know, three days later, I'm, when was she born? <laughs> so it has to be... I Believable. So, so the first thing I do is I create a complete background, like three generations back, who mm -hmm. the parents, grandparents, where they came from, and so mm -hmm. on. The whole family, her history. And then um, that's one step. And I have like, a huge binders of information and research and all that. Then, uh, and this is only my personal way of doing it, I uh, let that... Those characters live in my mind, and now by now the main characters are always there. I can see them as they, as they were real. I can see their eye color. I know their preferences. I know their gut, re their gut reactions to things would be, and so on. Then for my main character, who is a woman in her late 30s, so from Midwest, a visual artist, very different from me in every respect, uh, I had to sort of inhabit her so I could experience things through her eyes and for to do that I had to let her live in my head and so things that I I look at this and I can look as me I can also look at her as her and what she would see there is not the same thing as I would see and so uh, and then all their feelings all the relationships everything that happens and sometimes of course they want to have relationships that I didn't plan for them so you know that's very interesting and I I never quite know who should get the upper hand in that because, of course, you want to go with what's natural. You also have your own plan that you would want to do. So, so it's a kind of deliberate affective disorder or a deliberate schizophrenia that you're indulging in. How, how do you see this multiple voices or multiple genre 
multimodal bodies that you're yeah. entering at yeah. will. How, do, how does that work for it you? It is uh, deliberate in the sense that I am aware of what's going on. It's not, you know, there's no right. delusion involved. Right. And, um, and I can switch from one to the other, only the characters I know really, really well. I do sometimes, and again, not in any form of insanity, just as a practical matter, if I create, create a character, and I did for my model, for my novel, who I think is sort of rather perfect in many ways, mm -hmm. and never loses patience, and always makes rational and good choices, right. I have found myself thinking, you know, what would he do in this real <laughs> situation? And, and, and it has served me well. I yes. thought, yeah, of course, because he wouldn't lose so his... So it becomes a pragmatic problem-solving really, character. Well, to the degree to which I'm <laughs> listening to a right. fictional character I have myself created, yeah, but it is that. So. Would you like to read a portion of that? Sure. The, now, what I have with me is this is the opening chapter of the novel, and it's still in progress. It's not perfectly done yet. Um, it's called Managing Happiness, and it describes the experience of the main character in what they call leadership happiness therapy. Yes. And leadership happiness therapy is actually not under this exact label, but it's a, Google it. It's very common. There are many, many kinds. Yeah. There are many coaches and so on who mm -hmm. teach people to strategies how to be happier. Mm -hmm. So I will read a few paragraphs here and there if, if you don't mind, so to, just to no, give you a sense. Now, this is in her voice, which is different from mine, uh, hopefully, and... Um, it is kind of in, written in a conversational style. It's, it's a kind of a woman complaining about her situation. Mm -hmm. That is what it's supposed to be, although not so much here as it will be later. After six weeks of leadership happiness therapy, which my agency kindly sent me to, I find myself imagining my life as if it were a project, managing my life as if it were a project or a chronic disease. In order to accommodate the additional activities that the sessions put on my agenda, my every move is now controlled by a strictly time schedule and every second of my day is spoken for even more than before. Now, every moment I also ask, am I happy? Something that has never before occurred to me to wonder about. Of course I'm happy at my job. It is my dream job, doing something artistic and being paid for it. So she's... Obviously, this is creating, again, uh, conditions of scarcity for her. She does not have enough time to mm -hmm. meet her basic needs, such as sleep and uh, other stuff. And now, um, they were, this was suggested to them to do this. The, the agency is everybody for it. in the agency? No, it's voluntary. Oh. She was, however, she was sort of, it was hinted. She is an art director at this agency. She's mm -hmm. an artist by training. And, um, it was hinted that if she wanted to ever become a creative director, which is a higher position, that it would be very useful for her to, to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, she's not quite sure why that is, because is it like she's not happy enough for the clients to see or, you know, but she, she took it. She, she said, oh, I, I want to make sure that they understand that I am willing, that I will do anything it takes to climb up the ladder, because that's her project to get to the top. Because it's, is it financially stable if she does this? or Either it's, way, it's financially stable. No it's matter what. just that we are brought up to, if you get to one level, right. then you shoot for the next. Right. She has another reason. Is that, of course, unless she's at the, high, in the, at the highest position, right. she actually has no creative freedom. But if she were to attain that higher position, she would understand that no one does under those circumstances. But she doesn't know that yet. She thinks, if I were the one calling the shots, I would at least be doing something more creative. Uh, so this is just a little more information about what this uh, kind of therapy uh, mostly is. Melanie, my leadership happiness therapy coach, believes in what she's doing and is serious about her job. She starts by having me do inventories, and take surveys and fill out questionnaires with the sole intention of tailoring her word, our sessions to my unique needs. She really wants to help me make my life better. That is what gives her satisfaction. That is why she is passionate, her word, about what she does, because she feels she can truly make a difference in people's lives. During our meetings, uh, Melanie patiently introduces me to preaching, proselytizing, 
a theory of happiness that she subscribes to, a paradigm, a worldview, if you will, according to which happiness is something one learns. She divides it into the what and the how. For example, she taught me several happiness strategies that I am to use daily. Prioritize positivity. Schedule some pleasant events. Relabel things as play instead of work. And meditate. Using these, she says, will make me happier. This is the how. Personally, I am not sure that I understand the what. What is happiness? How do I evaluate my progress? I want some objective markers, but Melanie insists that the experience of happiness is more or less completely subjective. She encourages me to remember a moment when I felt really happy and then study it. That's where the answer lies. I told you this reminded me of Kafka <clears throat> somehow. There was sort of the feeling of ensnarement and entrapment in the office block, whether she was studying happiness or mm -hmm, whether she mm -hmm. was at her job. Is that what you wanted to create? Uh, not, I didn't have Kafka in mind, but mm -hmm. I definitely see the, the connection because it is this, you are trapped in this sort of bureaucratic situation mm -hmm. where, uh, where you stopped questioning the validity of the requirements that you have to uh, meet, mm -hmm. but rather all you do is try to meet them. Right. But you don't think beyond them. You say, well, are they right to ask or, you know, what is... But I thought it was so interesting. You said that people think if they try harder and get to the next level and all that. Mm -hmm. Now, does that same thing work that with the happiness factor? Uh, many times these trainings are sold as, okay, you will be less stressed, but you will achieve more. You will be happier, but you will achieve more. So it's all this like packing your schedule, again, scarcity of time. Would you like to read another, another part? Sure. Let me... Um... So I'm going to just retell this part. So mm -hmm. she doesn't really trust this therapist because the therapist is paid by her boss. And she's not sure mm -hmm. that they're not reporting to the boss. Mm -hmm. And one of the most important impressions you're supposed to leave at work, at least where she does, and, and as far as I know many other places, is that she's totally devoted to that work. There is nothing, nothing else in that life. in her life or that interests her. Mm -hmm. So she can't have like another pa passion for another uh, career or anything like that because mm -hmm. they would then probably look for somebody who's happy. And they would phrase it that way, say, are right. you still happy working here? And so if you're not still happy working here, mm -hmm. maybe you should look for a better, you know. So, so she knows that. She's trying not to tell them uh, what she really feels. However, because this is therapy and this woman is very skilled at what she does, mm -hmm. and she eventually starts opening up and starts talking to her. And also she does these uh, little activities that she was told to do, and that is also helps. After five weeks, I am still over-scheduling, of course. Indeed, that's unavoidable. But at Melanie's request, in addition to my work obligations, I also schedule good things, activities that will elicit positive emotions. My agenda used to be full of work and no play. Now it is still full, but in addition to 100% of time allotted to work, there is another 25% for play. Yes, I do understand that this is a mathematical nonsense, but I believe that it perfectly illustrates my point. And this is just the beginning. Ultimately, my objective is to slowly, over time, relabel most of the work items as play. Because, according to Melanie, it is not what we do that is the problem, it is how we approach it. Mm. So... She's going through these activities, and then at one point uh, she has an experience where she understands the what for the first time. What the, the what of happy, what happiness is, or what happiness would be for her. her. It's not the same for mm -hmm. everybody. Now, and I will read that first, and then I'll read the next paragraph. So she's at dinner. She has these very close, uh, close friends who are both artists, who are a couple. Mm -hmm. And they're talking, they have a dinner. That she scheduled that as her time play. with friends. That's <laughs> like her 25% play. Yeah. So they're talking about it. And uh, they're talking about the project they're going to do, and she's listening. <clears throat> and then this happens. 
And then, totally unexpectedly, my head filled with all these images, all the things I would like to paint. This is not entirely ridiculous. I have a BA in uh, studio art and an MA in painting. In the middle of our conversation, I suddenly started daydreaming. I imagined myself in a different reality where I had time to idly stare at the sky for hours or at water or grass, time to just be. Then, when my world had steadied and everything had fallen into its proper place, I would slowly sit down in front of my own easel and dip my brush into paint, its beautiful acrid smell filling my nostrils. I would pause, the brush hovering in the air, before I slowly, deliberately, without rushing, as if the rest of the world didn't exist and all of my time was my own, make a mark on the white canvas. And there it was, the what. I know one artist was asked, what were you thinking about when you painted your, your best painting? Mm -hmm. And they answered, I was thinking of the sandwich at lunch. And everybody was aghast. Mm -hmm. You know, they thought, what a commonplace thought mm -hmm. for such a great artist. Now, do you think there's something of humor in this, in the way she pictures herself? Is this a real... Picture of herself painting? Yeah. Uh, what I think, I mean, the way I'm right. planning it to be is that she had actually never done that for her. You know, she never had lived her life as an artist. She mm -hmm. always sort of sold her art for money. Right. Uh, so the, she discovered, you know, as Melanie said, you, you need to remember a moment when you were perfectly happy. And for mm -hmm. her, this moment, although imaginary, was perfectly ha perfect happiness. Mm -hmm. Now, it is left to be seen whether the same moment in reality would cause the same feeling. Again. But it gives her pause. It right. gives her, and I all, maybe this is it. Okay, so I'm in, on, you know, in the wrong game. If this is what makes me happy. Mm -hmm. She says, no time, no amount of relabeling my work activities from, you know, work to play will make me feel like that about what I'm doing at work. So, so is there a disconnect in time and space in this novella whereby these epiphanies can happen? In other words, despite this overnaming of time and, mm -hmm. and things that have to happen in, during the therapy sessions, is there some way that they get wiggle room? I think you're asking a very important question, and that is because she's approaching this as a complete nonsense. Right. Oh. Mm -hmm. But she's doing the activities that she was given to do. And those activities are working on her in ways that she doesn't understand, actually. Because suddenly, yes, the, the space is opening up in her brain where there was none before. The distance and the insight is opening up in a way that she didn't understand. But is it a cult novel? No, no, it's just a learning experience. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you learn intentionally, sometimes you learn while you're doing something else. And What's the part you haven't written yet? What will happen in the part I have? Oh, yeah. I, I didn't know you that's, can't tell that, us, right? That's, uh, in fact, going back to characters living in my right. head, almost everything that will happen has already happened in my head. I have like the whole arc of the novel. Really? Yes. Uh, not the details, but, yeah. you know, detail here, detail there. And sometimes when I work it out, I just write it in that proper place. So you actually have created all the characters and the plot, plot lines, the denouement, the rising and falling yeah, action yeah. <clears throat> within your brain ahead of time. Now, see, if I did that, I would be thinking, I know what's going to happen. So I don't want to know what's going to happen. Uh -huh. Even this way, you don't know. You still don't know. You still don't know because, because. characters will change, things will... And yes. not only that, but you can always learn from what's going on. To so change This it. is not done for me. I will watch them do things, and I will learn things about life, and I will learn, make new, have new insights. Because so of on. the characters. Because of the characters. They will teach me things I don't know yet. There was one novelist I interviewed, and she said she would deliberately interview seven people who were plumbers or seven people who were artists uh -huh. in order to make a composite character. Yeah. Would you do anything like that? I interviewed people, yes. yes. Uh, some she people, because I'm not familiar with this job at all. Right. So I interviewed several artists mm -hmm. who do similar things, and, uh, and that was extremely helpful. So yes, no, you, you do in a way have to. And I, I'm afraid I haven't done... 
I, I haven't finished yet, of course, but I haven't done as good a job, I think, at this point of knowing all my characters the way they would really be in real life. And maybe that's why they're wiggling in my brain and doing what they want, because I, you know, I don't really have good control over them yet. So, so is there anything that we haven't covered, like in your biography or in any part of your life that you wanted to, to address in, in our conclusion to our interview? No, I think I'm fine. I think maybe there's just one thing uh, to mention. I have, you know, I worked for years and years, and, and then I retired several years ago. And since I retired, I have become a full-time writer. And I consider this not so much retirement, but change in career. Yes. And are you, is it wrong to ask you, is that the happiness factor? For me, it is. Yes. For me, it is. For me, that's my happiness. Yes, I, I would not be happy not living this way. Thank you so much for being here with us today so that we could hear about creativity and the making. Thank you for having me. It was great pleasure. Thank you for me too.